Thank you all for coming out. Welcome to NAB 2018. Welcome to the Maxon booth. Uh, I'm always excited to be here. This is my ninth year here at the Maxon booth. They always bring some amazing artists, and I'm um, so uh, happy to be here on stage. So uh, I wanted to say hi to the internet, hi to my wife. Cheers. Back home. Miss you. Um, so if you're not familiar with me, uh, my name is Nick Campbell from Grayscale Gorilla. We make... Uh, tools, training, and tutorials for motion designers. We've been doing this for over nine years now. Our goal is to speed up your workflow. Uh, I did this, uh, worked in the industry for a long time, and anytime you can shorten the window from an idea or uh, something you want to experiment with and the final result, the more your clients love you, the more you get paid, the more you sleep better at night, the be more beautiful your work is, and that's our goal here at Grayscale Gorilla. We always love to show off uh, a few of our customers, and uh, so I wanted to show you a quick reel with some of the amazing work our customers have been making with our tools and training. So we always love seeing all the amazing work our customers are up to. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to uh, put this up just in case anybody wanted to take a photo of it. We're going to be giving away some of the scene files from my presentation and also Chris Schmidt's presentation later on today. He's also from Grayscale Gorilla. We also have a script uh, that I'll be showing you in this talk that we'll be giving away to anybody that uh, comes here and just signs up and you get some free downloads. Thank you so much. So today, uh, I wanted to show you a technique. Like I said, we're all about workflow. We're all about speeding up workflow and getting as much done uh, in the least amount of time. So today, I wanted to show you a technique that's been uh, taking things that in Cinema 4D can take up to three minutes, 30 minutes, up to three hours, and shrinking it down to 30 seconds or less. So I'm really excited to show you that. And uh, yeah, say what? Really? Is this real? It's real. So first, a quick story. I wanted to show you a photo of me. This is from 2004. This was a big year for me. First thing was, was I realized that you could drink coffee cold. Big, just mind explosion. Just get it in me as fast as possible. Uh, I, it might have been a cold day. That's a hot coffee, but that's another time. I also, uh, this was the year I started learning Cinema 4D, 2004. Uh, just opened my mind to what was possible. I was an After Effects artist and uh, didn't really love uh, you know, the current 3D tools at the time. And when I finally saw Cinema 4D and saw what was capable and it was artist friendly and easy to use and the, bu the buttons were round, I just loved this thing. So big, big year for me. And then the third one was digital photography became more affordable around this time. So I bought my first digital camera and wore it around my neck everywhere I went. You ask my friends around that time, they were kind of sick of me taking photos. Now, I've always been interested in photography, always been interested in, you know, borrowing my fa the, the family VHS camcorder and going around and shooting things. But I never got into film photography. And the difference for me was immediacy. The, the ability to grab a VHS camera and go shoot something and then rewind it and watch what you just made was uh, how my brain worked, right? I could try something and then watch the result and then go try it in a different way. With film at the time, you couldn't do that, right? You had to take a photo. If you wanted to remember your settings, you had to like write it down. You had to fill up a whole roll of film and then you had to get it developed, get it back and then try to compare notes like, okay, this was when I turned up the f-stop and this is what it looks like. As soon as digital uh, photography became affordable and you can now take a photo and look at it on the back of your camera and get results right away. And that's when I started learning much, much faster because I could tweak and experiment and try and get feedback as fast as possible. Maybe I had to wait until I got home to see it on a big screen, but it still was much more immediate. So that difference between uh, trying and experimenting and the final result uh, really was allowed me to become a better artist. 
by looking through a, a lens and learning how to frame things, learning how to uh, compose an image, it made all of my work better, even when I went, got back to After Effects and back to Cinema 4D. I learned how to try to make rectangles, things inside of glowing rectangles, as beautiful as possible. And digital photography was one of those things. Anytime you could take a tweak or an experiment and make the uh, result shorter, that's better, right? We can all agree on that. So with that, I, I wanted to show you where this workflow kind of came from. So this scene right here, uh, our creative director, Grayscale Gorilla, we've been working on this new plugin called Gorilla Cam. And uh, Chad Ashley made this beautiful scene to kind of show off Gorilla Cam. It moves your camera and does some really beautiful stuff. Won't be talking about that today. You can check it out on our site. But uh, he sent me this scene, and I was like, how? Like, it's playing back in the viewport, and it's beautiful. Like, this is almost real time, and I'm getting some depth of field, and we're getting some nice reflections, and I'm like, how, what kind of black magic did you do to make this happen? And so he's like, well, I used Cinema 4D. Like, no, that's it? You just use, he's like, yeah, the new R19 uh, viewport settings allow you to do this stuff. And that, and I didn't, it didn't dawn on me. Uh, you know, last year they announced R19 and put it out, obviously. R19, Cinema 4D, and they updated the viewport a lot. And I knew they put a lot of work into it, but honestly, I didn't really look into how much it improved the viewport. So when I saw the scene file, I started digging into it. I'm like, okay, what, what is this all about? So today I wanted to work through a, a workflow that allows me to use the viewport as much as possible to see as close to the final result as possible. So what I'm about to show you is not a replacement for your final render, it's not a replacement for physical render, but it does allow you to uh, get results, tweak your set settings, and see something that looks really beautiful in you know, 30 seconds or a minute instead of hours and hours if you do your final render. So first of all, what is this viewport? Why does it look so beautiful? Well, what I realized was in here, uh, in your options, uh, there's this button right here, Enhanced OpenGL. If I turn that off, this is kind of where we were before R19. Um, we had some rough textures you could see. You can you know, get the sense of colors, but you know, reflections didn't really show up very well. And things like depth of field, forget about it, right? None of that existed. So if we hit play, this is kind of the result we used to have before all the updated settings. And this wasn't very compelling to me, it, it, or it didn't give enough sense of what the final scene looked like, which meant I had to always go in and do a somewhat final render, or at least see what it looks like in physical. So here's kind of the old way um, before R19. You come in here, you turn on your physical render settings. Maybe you, you know, knock it down a little bit. You're not trying to do a final render. But what I'm really trying to see is what in general does this scene look like? Right? How, what are the, how are the reflections interacting? How are the textures interacting? How are the shadows working? And if I can get this into my viewport and into my uh, picture viewer, I can then maybe hand it off to an editor or, or hand it off to a client and say, here's roughly where we are with this project. So here's what I would have to do. I'd come in, turn on my physical render settings. I'd go to uh, my output settings, make sure we're turned on all frames. Uh, 1280 by 720, that's OK for a not final render, right? We'd turn this up later. But this will be good for a little demo. And I'm going to go ahead and hit render. And, uh, and then we go to lunch, right? Because physical render is, uh, is beautiful. I think the results of the physical render are amazing. But the um, uh, results can be a little bit slow, right? So we'd let this work itself out, maybe get a cup of coffee, iced coffee. Try it out. I promise it's very good. Um, and then we come back and see our rough result. Now, you can even see in this demo, uh, I turned down the settings to kind of speed up the render. And it's still, you know, it's a little grainy back here. And it's, you know, not quite where it is. But we also just uh, spent 23 seconds to get that one frame. And that's not bad. You know, we can take a break. But if, if the goal of this is to see where you are in a project, you definitely don't want to go through this process every time you just want to see where you are. So what's a better way to do this? Well, I started thinking, uh, let me go ahead and turn this off or just stop this render. Stop it. So I started thinking, well, wouldn't it be great? Nick, you're so smart. You're, you, have, you have great ideas, Nick. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way to get this viewport into your picture viewer 
and then be able to send that off to a client. So, you know, my brain started, we, we make plugins and all that, so maybe we have to make a plugin or maybe write some things. And then I started digging into it and it dawned on me, this exists already, and it's always been in Cinema 4D, and it's called Hardware OpenGL. Anyone use the Hardware OpenGL before? Right, so it, when, when you used to use Hardware OpenGL, you got something that looked more like this. Okay, which again, wasn't that useful in seeing where your scene was. But now when you use Hardware OpenGL, you get something that looks like this. So let me show you this real fast. If you come into your render settings, you can turn on Hardware OpenGL. And we're gonna get to the render in, uh, you know what, this will actually work out okay. I'm gonna go into these settings in more uh, detail when we get to a project. We're gonna start a project from scratch and I'll show you this workflow all the way through. Um, but for now, let's just see the difference. So now we have open, uh, enhanced OpenGL turned on, so you want to make sure that's on. And again, I'll go through more of these settings in a minute. But let's just do a comparison render. I'm going to go ahead and hit render, and now you're going to see uh, why I'm so excited about this workflow. It's going to start rendering, and it's going to start rendering pretty much right away, and our render time is zero seconds per frame. That means it's less than a second per frame, and it's gonna go through this whole entire render and start to show us what our rough reflections, what our depth of field is looking like, and all of this, right? And to me, um, this, is, this is passable, right? It's never gonna be a, for a final render, especially for something like this, but uh, we're gonna be able to hand this off to an editor, we're gonna be able to maybe send this to a client and say, here's roughly where we are, and it's gonna take you know, a minute maybe to render instead of 27 seconds per frame, right? Okay, so as this goes, we're gonna watch this cache line. And I think we turn up the RAM settings, but you know, basically if, if, if you're not familiar with the picture viewer, this line at the bottom here is a RAM preview. All of these green uh, frames are cached in RAM, which means we're gonna be able to see our render in real time, okay? And if you've ever worked on, let me, let me get a poll here. Has anybody worked in um, X particles or dynamics and worked on a really nice like explosion or something and then you go to render it and you watch the final render and it's like five times faster than you expected, right? Has anybody ever gone through that? Like all of a sudden all the dynamics just go and it looks all wimpy. You want it to go real slow. This solves that problem. Getting it into the picture viewer and seeing your scene as it really will be in the final uh, uh, edit is, is key, it's key to this entire process. So as this renders, um, uh, we're gonna go, again, we'll go into the settings in a second, but let's just go ahead and hit play. And you'll see what we're getting back now is not the viewport, it's actually um, real time showing us what our camera move is doing, because we have some nice little jittery camera stuff from Gorilla Cam. we have some little reflections. And again, this is not perfect, but we're getting this in seconds rather than hours, right? So. What I wanted to show you was you know, how to set this up, where you can dial in these settings, and how it works in different types of scenes. Because you, you, know, you might be like, Nick, yeah, that's one scene, but how does it look in mine? I'm gonna show you a bunch of different ones and show you how to set this up. As we finish this render, I wanted to make one thing clear. You do have to use uh, reflectance uh, as a part of this. So the new physically based shaders that are also in R19, this is a good place to start. If you're wanting your reflections in your final render, in, in this viewport, uh, you wanna make sure that you're using uh, the, the reflectance settings. So if you have older scenes, you might need to update them. It also works uh, better with HDRs than it does with lights, right? This viewport does pretty well with lights, but it doesn't show you as realistic of reflections if you're using point sources as if you're using an HDR. But HDR is becoming much more popular these days, so you probably won't have any issues. Okay, so we're, let's talk about the settings. So the viewport settings are not only up in here, up in here, y'all gonna make me lose my mind. Um, they're also, uh, so let's check these out. You have enhanced OpenGL, and then you have reflections. Uh, this stands for, this is ambient occlusion. This is screen space ambient occlusion. You have tessellation, which is basically uh, deforming objects, and then you have depth of field. So for example, if you turn off depth of field, it'll turn it off in your viewport. You could come up here into your options and turn it back on. But there's another way to control these settings that I go to more because I have a little bit more control. And that is this. This is the first keyboard shortcut of the day. Shift V. Now Shift V, as in viewport, is gonna bring up your viewport settings. And in here you're gonna see enhanced OpenGL. 
these checkboxes are very similar to what we saw up top. We have our shadows, we have enhanced OpenGL, uh, tessellation, depth of field, and they do exactly the same thing, except this nice little triangle over here. Okay, so what is this all about? So the triangle allows you to jump into a little bit more detail. In this case, we can add our HDRI to our environment. This means that uh, the HDRI that we're using in our scene can also be used by our viewport. And in fact, um, our uh, HDRI Studio Rig, if you use that, uh, the newest version coming out very soon, it'll be a free update to anybody that owns it, does this automatically. So you'll be able to use HDRI Studio Rig and then see the result in the viewport in real time. So that's this setting. You can also rotate it. Um, and uh, Honestly, I kind of leave this closed. I don't mess with the reflection settings as much. Now, screen space, amp, excuse me, screen space ambient occlusion. So what is this? Well, this is kind of an ambient occlusion fake. Okay, so instead of calculating ambient occlusion uh, as, as the physical render would, it's doing kind of a fake to, to make the, the viewport as accurate as possible. So what, it, what are these settings? So first we have radius. This is really similar to, uh, let, let me turn this on and off real quick so you can see the, the difference. Now, it's a subtle difference, but the contact shadows between the camera and it sitting on, on the table is really what this is selling. Without it, our objects are kind of floating. You can see it in the markers as well. They're, they're kind of floating. They're, they, they're not grounded. Screen space ambient occlusion allows you to see those contact shadows, be able to fake it. Depth range is kind of like, uh, how, how, far off the f how far off the floor do you want things to look? So bigger objects, smaller objects, you'll want to tweak this. Uh, I just do it to taste, right? There, it, it's going to be different based on the scale of your scene on a lot of stuff. So I dial these up, uh, up and down pretty, um, you know, with not sure exactly what, what the number I'm going for. I just look at the screen. Now, power is really obvious what this does. You crank up power, it's just going to turn up your screen space ambient occlusion. That's a little heavy for me. <laughs> I'm going to go back down to one, maybe two. Let's take a look at two. That's maybe exaggerated, but that's OK. And then samples will uh, refine that shadow and make it less blocky. So it all depends on how much time you need to render. Now, lastly, uh, I'll go into the depth of field settings here in the enhanced OpenGL. And you can see we have some. Um, let me move up our scene a little bit, kind of get this camera a little blurry back there. We have some nice depth of field, and you can also turn it up and down here in your settings, and it'll add more depth of field. But you can also do it in your camera itself. In this case, we have an f-stop of 1. It's going to be a little bit unrealistic here, but I'm going to shrink this down, um, the, the shrink the number down. But as you shrink an f-stop down, it actually adds uh, more blurriness, right? So less depth of field is more blurriness. They make it as confusing as confusing as possible for all of us. But the smaller the number, the more depth of field you get. So everybody see that move. Well, let's, let's move it back to 1. But that's where you set it, right? Um, and while we're talking about this, let's, let, let me be clear about one more thing. When you change the settings here in your viewport settings, I'm going to hit Shift-V, go to depth of field. If you change these settings, it does not affect your final render. Your final render settings, if you, when you turn on physical and you do your actual final render, you're going to have to change your settings here. Or if you turn on uh, ambient occlusion, those settings will be separate from this. Does that make sense? So this is the kind of fake viewport settings to make it look as good as possible while you're working and tweaking. This in physical render is going to allow you to make your final render look as good as possible. Because we don't mind waiting for our final render, right? That's OK. But if we have to wait for that render every time we make a tweak, that's what we're trying to solve. OK. So with that in mind, I wanted to show you a few more scenes of just how this works in some scenes. I wanted to show you a quick script that we, write, that we wrote uh, to help you with this workflow uh, that you could download for free uh, tomorrow. And, um, uh, and then also, it, I'm going to try to do this from scratch so you can see the entire workflow. So let me show you. Um, just, I just found some scene files that kind of show off what this is. Now, if you've seen our tutorial about um, taking mocap data and applying it to um, objects and, and animating it and all that stuff, this may look familiar. But I wanted to bring it up because I thought this was a kind of a cool scene because we have uh, real-time reflections going on, and we have all this other stuff. Now, if we do this render, let's go ahead into our render settings, turn on hardware OpenGL, which we did. And we turn on Enhanced OpenGL. And I, I didn't go over this, but you basically want to turn on all the checkboxes that you 
have turned on over here. So over here, we have in our viewport checkboxes to turn on what our viewport looks like. Okay, And then in our render settings, you basically want to mirror it to make sure that it looks the same. Okay. I'm going to turn this to none, and we're going to talk about these settings in a, in a second. Uh, OK, but let's go back and talk about this render. So one thing to look at here, and I want to make sure that this works. OK, cool. Uh, one thing that I don't love about when we do this, this workflow is that when we render this into the viewport, uh, i got to turn off our saving. Don't want to save it. There we go. OK, so when we render this into our viewport, uh, let me shrink this down. Ooh, even more. We're getting all the reflections. We're getting our objects. We're getting our dancers. But what else are we getting? Well, we're getting all the all the actual bones inside of that of this uh, character. We're getting the knoll down here. We're getting the floor grid. We're getting a lot of extra detail because it's literally rendering our rendering our scene file, and we don't want all that extra detail sometimes. So this is where uh, we started looking at getting a script to get this together. So the problem we were trying to solve is in this menu here. This filter menu allows you to control what is in the viewport. So in this case, uh, if you look at the axis bands uh, or the axis itself, if we turn that off, the axis uh, that allows you to grab and move things around turns off in your scene. Well, this is cool, right? This allows us to maybe turn off some of these things, render it into our picture viewer, and then get a cleaner result. Well, but rather than go and hand turn on all on and off all of these settings, we wanted a way to quickly clean up the uh, screen and then go back when you needed to. And so that's why we wrote the script um, right here. So it, if it's up in the scripts. I already have it installed. Uh, if you end up downloading it, uh, it'll end up. There's a lot more scripts in here than, uh, than I use. Let me make sure it's all in here. Filter switch, thank you. So filter switch allows you to quickly switch between uh, all these filters basically on on their defaults. And then so let's go ahead and hit the filter switch button. It's going to turn off your grid. It's going to turn off your axis bands. It's going to turn off almost everything that doesn't need to be there for the render so that when we go ahead and hit render again, that it's a much cleaner look. So let's go ahead and do that. And now you can see it's a much cleaner look. We, we now can put this, you know, send this to a client or, or uh, put it in an edit without all that little detail. So let me show you another scene here. Let me uh, stop rendering. Yes, I do want to stop it. And show you another example. Let's go with, uh, this one's pretty fun. So this is uh, this nice car model here. It's a nice Jeep. We have this simple little animation. In this scene, we have uh, an HDRI that's rotating around our scene, doing a full 360, and kind of showing off the, the details of this car. Now, in the viewport, this looks pretty good. Now, in fact, we already have it off. Let me turn um, our uh, filter switch back off again. This is kind of what our viewport would look like. And if we had stuff selected, it would have even more kind of you know, junk in our screen here. Now, this stuff is very useful when we're working in the screen, but when we go to do a render, uh, we don't want this stuff showing up. So let's go ahead and do a render. I'm going to open this up here a little bit more. We obviously don't want this rotation thing in the screen. We don't want the grid on the floor. So all you have to do is hit filter switch. It'll all turn off. You can then do a render and get a much more clean result in the picture viewer. And then when you're ready to work again, you just hit filter script, and everything will turn back on rather than hand do it. OK, so this will be a good example to show you um, some more settings inside of your render settings that will make this even more beautiful. So let's go ahead. Uh, let me make sure the hardware OpenGL. OK, cool. So it's on already. So let me turn this off, and I'll demonstrate what these settings do as we go through it. OK, so check out how fast this is, by the way. This is rendering, and in less than 20 seconds, we're going to have our, our look. I'm going to shrink this down. I know I keep moving it up and down, but OK. So here, here's our look. So this has a lot going for it. We have some nice reflections, but does everybody see like the anti-aliasing going on? There's a lot of 
jitter and little weird lines going on on the top of the screen. Some of that is because we're looking at this at 50% instead of 100, but a lot of it is coming from the way that this is rendered. Because it's trying to render as fast as possible, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not overly concerned about anti-aliasing and some of the finer details you want in something that looks closer to a final render. So luckily, uh, this was a, a huge surprise to me, inside the hardware OpenGL settings, there are two settings that try to solve this problem. One of them is anti-aliasing. You can turn up the anti-aliasing right here inside the hardware OpenGL. Let's just turn this to four and do uh, basically a, a test between the two. Obviously, it's going to render a little bit slower, um, but it's going to clean things up quite a bit. Not a, not a ton in this case, mostly because uh, there's a lot of reflection uh, issues, not as much anti-aliasing. So, okay, well, that works sometimes, but it's really the second setting that I'm most excited about. It's called super sampling. And this is a brute force way of getting sharper edges and, and basically a more beautiful OpenGL renderer. Uh, and I was told what it really does is just render it twice as big or four times as big or eight times as big and then shrink it back down to its original size. So that's, that's mostly what it's doing behind the scenes. It's literally brute forcing it. So if we turn this up to four by four, it's going to basically render a four times larger image, shrink it back down, and give us better looking depth of field. And in this case, let's go ahead and hit render better looking reflections. And you'll see it refine itself. It actually will do like an image over an image and, and show it better over time. Now, I'm going to uh, try to get this right the first time. I, oh, I think that's the first time I've ever done that right. That is another uh, keyboard command that I use often enough to forget it, but not quite enough to remember it. I probably got that wrong, too. But the, what it is is Control-Tab. If you ever want any one of these windows to be full screen, all you have to do is kind of hover your mouse over it, hit Control-Tab, and now you have whatever window you're over will just fill your screen. In this case, I want the picture viewer, so there we go. Now I can go to 100% and uh, show you how the anti-aliasing is going. Obviously, taking a little bit longer, but look at that image, right? This took still less than one second to render, and, uh, and it looks as good as it does. So now you can really do some tests. Let's imagine you wanted to see this car with different types of HDRIs rotating around it, maybe in different colors. Maybe they want to see it in red and black and orange and, uh, you know, egg, uh, you know, baby, baby, baby blue. I'm running out of colors, I know. So already looking much better. And again, like this is in seconds we're getting this quality out of the new render. Okay, so control tab to go back. Very good. Okay, cool. So let me show you um, uh, one, well, a couple more here and then we'll go do the workflow from start to finish. Um, let's go with something with dynamics because this issue comes up for me all the time. You're working in dynamics. In this case, you have, uh, uh, we have this nice skull here and let's go ahead and hit play. And what do we have? Well, we have some uh, fracture. Uh, some Vronoi fracture from the last few versions of Cinema 4D. They added this ability to shatter. Uh, and, and then, of course, they've had really amazing dynamics in Cinema 4D for such a long time. So I took this scene file and I applied a couple of things that we talked about. I turned on reflections, I turned on depth of field, and I added the, the fracture Vronoi and, it, and exploded it, right? So pretty simple scene. We have a, um, uh, I think it's a random effector coming through. Yes, so we have a random effector coming through to kind of explode our skull. And now we're left with this, right? It's looking pretty good. But here's the issue I mentioned earlier. We see this result and we're like, that looks pretty good. Let's see what it looks like in full, uh, in full frame rate. Because right now we're getting, you know, not full frame rate. So we, let's go to our render settings, hardware open GL. I'm going to leave this at none for now. And then I'm going to use filter switch to turn off all the stuff that we don't need in the scene. So now we have this nice clean render. So again, like before, we have our HDRI shown, we have our, our random effector shown, and we hit filter switch and it just cleans it up. So now let's render this into our viewport, control tab, and we're gonna get this uh, real time playback as soon as this renders. Now, you can also watch it in the meantime. Boom, hit play. But I, I, actually, while this is rendering, has anybody ever experienced where this green line starts shrinking? Like it doesn't, it, it won't allow you to view the entire renders. Anybody run into that? Okay, so I, I, whenever I run into that, 
I jump up into our uh, preferences. I think I did this during my demo, so it's not going to do it today. But you could just go to your preferences, and you go to memory, and right here. So the memory by default is usually set to one gig, okay? And uh, I usually crank it up. I set to two to four. It all depends on how long your scenes are. Uh, and if you, you have really long scenes, you might just might not have enough RAM to do it. But I tend to turn this up to two or four uh, gigs, and this will allocate more RAM to the, the viewport playback. So it's already set to four, so we should be fine. Let's go back and see our result. Now, this is pretty good, right? We're getting real-time feedback now. It's nice and like slow, and the depth of field's looking pretty good. And again, we just got that render in seconds. And it's very like passable to like see what this is really looking like. But let's pretend that we needed to uh, like change the, the speed of it. Let's say we wanted this to be a much more like fast, like, like more like a light bulb is popping and less epic like it is now. Well, in the past, we would have had to wait for either physical render with really low settings or kick something else that looks way less um, realistic out to, to check our timing. Now, all we have to do is change our setting, try it out again, and we'll get a we'll get that beautiful of a result in seconds. So how do we do this quickly? So there, here's another uh, keyboard command. I'm going to uh, hit it before. OK, I did it right. Command D. Command D takes you to your project settings. And more importantly, it takes you to your dynamic settings, which I use way more than the project settings. Uh, right here, you can see that dynamics have time scale. This allows you to speed up and slow down your dynamics without changing anything in your scene. If all you need to do is speed up or slow down how fast things are falling, this is the place to do it. So in this case, let's just uh, let's double it. Let's say, OK, the explosion looks good, but we want it to happen twice as fast. Um, I just went from 20% to 40. I'm going to go to our render here, hit render, say yes. I'm going to go full screen. And now, what we should see is the dynamics working twice as fast. Now, our random effector is still moving the same speed, but the actual gravity and the dynamics, the way that it works, should be much faster. And I always do this. I can't wait. See, I told you, I just I like to work fast. So now we're getting faster uh, uh, gravity, and we get to see that result right away. OK, so let me do this from scratch, because I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything. A lot of our tutorials on Grayscale Gorilla, we like to start from scratch, because we want to show you how quick it is to get into all this stuff. And we don't want to leave any parts out. We don't want to start with a model that you can't use. We don't want to start with you know, something that you can't follow along with. So let me start really quickly from scratch here and show you this workflow. So uh, a brand new scene file. We're going to make a really quick little MoGraph animation and then add some depth of field, some reflections, and get all this stuff uh, looking good. So let's start with a cylinder. And uh, let's go ahead and just shrink it down. And let's add some bevels. Uh, Barton was talking earlier today about adding details and bevels to everything. I totally agree. Uh, sharp, sharp angles like that do not exist in real life. Always add a little bit of bevel. All right, in this case, I'm just going to uh, shrink this radius down to something small. Yeah, that's about right. And so we have our cylinder. Let's go to uh, MoGraph, add a cloner. And uh, if you're new to Cinema 4D, they have a really nice child-parent relationship. Um, and uh, the, the way you do it is you just drag your object into a cloner, and it will automatically clone. In this case, it made three copies on top of each other, so it's not very useful for us right now. But they have a ton of settings in here to make it how we want. Uh, this new honeycomb array is new in the last few versions. I use it all the time. And I'm going to set it to uh, Y orientation instead of Z. So you can see what we have now are all of our cylinders kind of like in scene here, moving around. And so let's grab our cloner and shrink this down. I want to make these all kind of sit next to each other and be almost like a bunch of little, little candles here. All right, shrinking down, getting better. Zoom in. Tweak this a little bit more. Tighten this up. Do the tighten up. Clap, 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 clap. All right, let's turn this up. We're going to do uh, 40 by 40. Get a bunch of clones rocking here. And uh, what else do we need to do? OK, so real quick animation. Let's grab our cloner. Let's grab uh, the rotation here and rotate our object. Just co so kind of angling in space. And then let's add a camera. Now, I talk about this a lot. I won't go into it too much today. But um, 
the default camera lens is a 36 millimeter lens. And I want you to always remember, like this, just like me in 2004, um, it is up to you to choose what lens you're, you're using in Cinema 4D. Don't let Cinema 4D choose the lens for you. Uh, 36 is fine. I don't mind a 36. But um, in so many uh, studios around the world, people are changing lenses every day to get the look that they want. And I want you to remember that. You are in control. So yes, I want a 100 millimeter lens. I'm going in. And look, it's free in Cinema 4D. You don't have to go buy no more glass, right? It's all built in. So we have a much more flattened look with a 100 millimeter lens, much more zoomed in. OK, and so now what are we going to do? Well, um, let's go ahead and uh, add a, let's go add a texture to this. So I'm going to open up. Remember, we made a uh, new PBR material. You can also, um, and so if you add that, you could add reflections there. We also have a plugin called Top Coat that lets you um, add reflections very easily in, uh, in Cinema 4D, and specifically with reflectance and allowing you to layer your reflections. In this case, let's make it really easy. We'll do um, a base color. And then we'll add, I'm going to shift to add a gloss on top of it. And that's just going to add a blurry reflection. So if I go back to our materials, we're going to add this to our cylinder. And now we have some nice reflections. Uh, before we leave um, top coat here, I'm just going to add a little bit of color. So you could do this over here. Add, uh, what the heck, I'm feeling, I'm feeling happy today. Let's, let's get some pink. Let's get some light pink reflections. Looking good. Oh, baby, looking nice. OK, so now, where do we go from here? Well, let's, uh, let's get some, um, uh, oh, let's get some HDRI in here. So now uh, we're going to go to uh, plugins and add HDRI Studio Rig. Now, uh, we have plenty of tutorials about this, but mostly it'll add a, a HDRI HDRI into your scene. I'm going to turn off all the backdrop stuff. Uh, and it allows you to browse um, HDRIs in this nice browser. And it allows you to try different HDRIs very quickly inside of Cinema 4D. So right here, I'm just clicking on these different HDRIs and getting completely different looks in this scene. This one's a little darker. This one's got a nice you know, green tint, kind of adding a little hue to it. Um, but let's see what I kind of like this one. It's got this backlight. OK, so this is looking nice. That's good. We got our camera. So now, let's talk about these settings. We have to add our viewport settings. Let's hit Shift-V. And we want to turn on depth of field. We want to turn on screen space ambient occlusion. You can see it added a little bit uh, of detail there. And quickly, let's add a little bit of variation in our scene by going up to MoGraph, going to our effector, and hitting random. Now. I don't want uh, our objects, uh, really quickly, the random effector moves objects in your cloner in random ways. And you can also control in, w in which direction do you want it to be random. In this case, I don't want x to be random. I'm going to turn that off. I don't want z to be random. I just want it to move randomly up and down. And in fact, I think it's going too far so I could l lower it. So let's get a kind of a cool look going. That's, that's nice enough. OK, we have our camera. We have our depth of field turned on. But remember, our physical uh, camera settings also affect our depth of field. So let's go in here and turn on something much, much lower, like 1. 1 is pretty low, um, but we could even go more crazy and do something like 0.5. Now, I was amazed how beautiful this depth of field looks. In this case, uh, we have nothing in focus, so we need to solve that problem. Let's go ahead into our camera, go to our object uh, menu, and click on fo focus distance. You could choose the uh, focus distance in your Cinema 4D camera very easily by clicking this arrow. Click the arrow. It'll turn black. And then just click on the part of the screen you want to be in focus. That will be in razor sharp focus. And then your depth of field will kind of spread itself out among the rest of your objects. I'm going to drop this on a tighter angle so we could see the depth of field a little bit more. I'm also, uh, because Cinema 4D is so um, uh, parametric and non-destructive, we can make tweaks to all this stuff at any moment. So I'm going to come into our cloner, and I'm going to uh, shrink the size width. I don't want them to uh, be touching, no touching. And I'm also going to add a little bit more count because I don't want it to move. I'm also going to turn on render instances because that's going to speed up our viewport and all this stuff. OK, so now. We have this pretty simple scene, but um, all right, let's see here. Let's change our focus, get it back in the middle of the, of the uh, 
scene here a little bit more, much better. And you know what? I am so happy with like how good this depth of field looks that we're just gonna exaggerate it even more because I wanna see I wanna show you like how the like the bokeh bokeh stuff like looks in the background even even with like one second renders um, in this viewport. Okay. So it looks like we got it pretty much set up. So how do we, oh let's uh, let's get this animating just so we could see it move a little bit. Really quick thing you could do with a random effector. You could there's more powerful ways to do this with shaders uh, shader effectors, but a really fast way to do this is with uh, the noise setting. Turning on your noise, turning on indexed, and then um, adjusting your animation speed. So let's hit play and see what we have. First of all, we're getting pretty good uh, playback in our viewport right now with depth of field with all this stuff turned on. And again, at any moment, if we want to try different lighting, uh, we could just come down here and, and check this stuff, render it out, and see the tweaks, right? OK, so that looks pretty good to me. I'm going to turn up the parameter just so we move a little bit further in distance. And that looks pretty good. OK, so w what else do we need to do now? Well, in the past, we would uh, have to turn on physical render, uh, turn on depth of field, um, even at low render settings. You know, go to, let's go to zero. Uh, let's turn these down. I mean, like really low render settings. Good. Let's turn off save, uh, and let's render all frames. So this is kind of the the past workflow was like drop the render settings really low, and then get a kind of rough, blurry, pixely version of the final render. And again, when you really crank the settings up on physical render, let me make this big, bigger. It's kind of silly. I made it so small. But again, if you want to crank up the settings, get rid of some of this grain, this will be a beautiful final render. Physical render is very capable, very beautiful, but it could take a little bit of time, right? In the meantime, uh, just to kind of see where, you, where we are in this scene, let's do the fake version, right? Let's do the test. Uh, so instead of waiting, let's wait for our first frame here. Instead of waiting 38 seconds for the frame, which really even on our final, we'll have to turn up even more to get rid of some of that grain. Let's see what the uh, new workflow gives us. So let's go up. Let's go to our viewport. I'm going to move our uh, textures back down here. Oh, oh I'll, I'll do that in a second. Um, so let's see what this gets us. So let's go to render settings. Let's go to hardware OpenGL. Don't forget you have to come in here and turn on enhanced OpenGL. This is why I did this from, uh, from scratch, so I can show you the entire workflow. Make sure you turn on an enhanced OpenGL, and then make sure you turn on all the settings it, that are on in your viewport if you want it to look the same. So over here we have reflections. We have uh, screen space AO. And we have uh, depth of field. OK, and we'll leave the anti-aliasing le left at, at 0 for now. Let's do a render here and see what the difference is. Now, in this case, it's, again, less than a, a second of frame. And we could turn up the anti-aliasing if we want that to turn on. And, and obviously, we could all see it. it's not going to be the same look, the exact same look as our physical render. It's, it's a completely different render. But what we are getting are the same reflections and similar depth of field without having to wait over a minute per frame. And we could start to see, like, wow, that actually, this is a great example. This is moving way faster than I thought it was. Did anybody else ha just have that moment, like, look at the screen and go, they look too jittery now. In the viewport, OK, in the viewport, they looked uh, a little bit more, like, a little bit more chill. And that's because we're not getting real-time playback right here. So let's go ahead and do it. Great example. Good demo, Nick. You're the man. OK, so Command-D. Uh, we're going to come into to Dynamics and turn our time scale down. Oh, I take that back. Almost did it. That's uh, the opposite. We actually have a random effector that's affecting this, not Dynamics. So all we have to do is come into our random effector, go to our animation speed, and, and turn it down. So now we can render it uh, half, half the time, hit Render. And again, we get this very, very quickly. And even while it's rendering, I mean, this is, this is my workflow. This is really, I'm like, OK, this is good. I'll render out that pass. But while that's rendering, uh, you know, let's head on in here and go to, like, a, like, maybe it's not a studio look for the reflections. Maybe it's something more like, um, let's see here. Maybe it's something more like, oh, one of my favorites, church entrance. I love this one. So maybe it's more like this, like it's a side lit look. And maybe my client will like that. Or let's see what this looks like in, in the edit. And so now I just click one button, 
and click render, and now we have that example. And now we have this one. We can kind of see what it looks like, maybe talk with the client about it, or this one. And again, get drastically um, different results without having to wait for it. One last thing I want to do, uh, that's always the curse when I say one last thing. It usually means there's about four more things coming. But very, very close here to the end. Uh, I want to go into our render setting, shift V, go to depth of field, and, and turn this up, OK? So what I'm trying to do now is match the amount of depth of field with our final render, which you saw had a ton. Um, so again, I made the tweak. And now I can uh, just go ahead and hit render and see the difference. Did it make a difference? Yes, like more, more blurry in the background here. And while we're at it, let's kind of do, let's kind of turn everything on and see what we can make this look like. Um, I'm not an, an entirely happy with the screen space ambient occlusion. I want to turn that up. I want to add a little bit more contact shadow between our objects. So this means I'm turning up our radius as well. Let's go see what this looks like in the viewport, because we can get almost real-time feedback here. Better. There we go. See, now I'm adding more shadows. That's a little bit heavy. Let's, let's dumb that down. Looking good. And then let's go into our render settings. And remember, we have these super sampling and anti-aliasing options. So I mean, these are so fast that I just kind of use them almost all the time. It doesn't really slow it down too much. Um, and I want, I want to also mention that this is a five-year-old GPU on this machine. This is uh, what, I, what, what a lot of people love to call a cheese grater Mac that, is, that this demo is on. So I wanted to show you, like, even on that uh, like older tech, this is how fast this is, this is rendering. So you can imagine, if you have a faster machine or a more modern machine, how much faster the OpenGL works, because it is based on your uh, graphics card. So let's just wait for this to render. You can see it's taking a little bit longer per frame uh, because it's doing that super sampling. But again, like check out the depth of field and look, and look at how the reflections are all working. And I was just, I had so much fun playing with all this stuff because I, can't Im I, I couldn't imagine how great a renderer was basically built into Cinema 4D. The ability for me to get this level of quality to test out ideas and to uh, be able to do this on, on almost any tech in the last few years was just really amazing to me, especially with all the crazy graphics cards and stuff that a lot of people would need in a, in a newer render. So I was just blown away. 2004 Nick with that, with that camera around his neck uh, as he just started learning Cinema 4D back then on version 9, I think it was, something around there, uh, would have been blown away if he saw this and was, and, and was able to get this level of quality in seconds in Cinema 4D instead of hitting render and going to bed like I used to back then. So I've been really excited about this workflow. Again, I wanted to stress that this is not a replacement for your final render. If, if you're getting closer to the end, you're going to want to come back into your final render settings, turn on physical. We have a, a ton of tutorials on uh, physical render settings and how to dial that in with your textures and your lighting. But that workflow alone has allowed me to uh, just look at my scenes in a completely different light didn't mean to make a pun right there, but it just allowed me to open up old scene files and like play with them in a way that I never could have imagined and, and iterate more. So you know, one last thing is that iteration process. For me to have an idea with this scene file, if we had a few more minutes, 10 more minutes, we could all have ideas on how to improve this scene. And what's really uh, groundbreaking to me about some of these workflows is now we have the ability to tweak, play, change the color, change the depth of field, change the camera angle, change the object, and make something completely different and get a rough idea of what it looks like in seconds instead of hours. And to me, that's what this workflow is about. Um, if you want to get some of these scene files and, of course, the filter script that uh, allows you to, or filter switch that allows you to um, change those filter settings, uh, don't forget to uh, here's some keyboard commands. <laughs> uh, don't, don't forget to head to our website and uh, download. So uh, if you go there today, you can click on any one of the downloads. And once you download it, as soon as we get home from NAB, we're going to send everybody that downloads anything today that script and some of the scene files. And you'll get some from uh, Chris Schmidt as well. So with that, um, I encourage you to check this out. Please go home and try this stuff. And let me know if you find anything else, because I'm always learning as well. So with that, thank you again to Maxon. And thank you guys so much for coming out. I really appreciate it.